So welcome everyone as we um, wait for more people to settle in. Um, you can grab cushions or blankets over here if you'd like. Um, there's a kitchen that has some tea that's the water's warming up and the bathrooms are in the back as well. So make yourself comfortable. <clears throat> and we'll get started in just one second. We got real candles, we got faux candles, we got spotlights. Um, so I'm just reminded of something as I was coming in and sitting down that in, um, so as many of you know, I lived in a, a monastery in the Himalayas for a while. And um, my teacher, whenever she would come into the room, she would prostrate to the Buddha in front of us, in front of the students, as a way of saying her ego is lower than ours. Um, kind of like that moment of humility and humbleness of like, we don't really have hierarchy here, especially at a center like this where it's community run. Um, and so that, that prostration of her getting down onto the ground and bowing in front of the Buddha was a way of um, kind of signaling that her, um, she's kind of, uh, giving herself over to the teaching. And so I wanted to just start tonight with bowing to all of you, uh, that I trust the enlightened mind that's already in you, um, and that my role here is really just to point to what's already there. Um, so it's always a very comforting idea for me to know that in my heart of hearts, I'm already enlightened, I'm already a Buddha. I'm just confused and deluded and I forget that. <laughs> so um, it, it's also nice to say that out loud because um, I think it feels good when you hear someone say they trust your natural instincts, right? So um, I teach in a lot of queer communities and there's a lot of shame and, um, and self-deprecation and being able to say, actually, you're perfect and complete as you are. I'm just pointing to that. So I'll just start with those sentiments. So welcome everyone that's in the space and online. Good to see all of you. See some friends there. Wonderful to have you joining. Um, so for those of you that I haven't met, my name is Tig. Uh, I'm a meditation teacher and a contemplative artist. Um, so I kind of mix uh, the um, conceptual ideas in Dharma with art. Um, so I teach at a design school in New York City, uh, contemplative art um, programs. Um, I also teach in universities and hospitals. Um, so I teach a secular um, program called Mindfulness-Based Stress Reduction. And also, as many of us in this Sangha are familiar with, I also teach Cultivating Emotional Balance. Um, so these are programs that are grounded in Dharma but presented in a way that's secular. It doesn't require any sort of uh, worldview, uh, religious worldview, or specific spirituality. <coughs> the idea is that it's universal. Um, so this class is really kind of coming together uh, in a more overt way um, of how the, the Dharma and the secular expression of it can inform each other. And so my goal in this class, or I should say my intention, is not to say one is better than the other or pit them against each other because they're both beneficial in their own ways. This class, the series, is really just exploring how they can support each other, how they shake hands. Um, and in many ways, at the end of the class, we realize it's the same thing. Um, so that's kind of the uh, idea of the offering. Um, tonight we're going to be talking about reactivity. So for the past two months we've been talking about attachment and aversion uh, and kind of what the secular programs have to say about that versus the Dharma and how they support each other. And so tonight we're going to go a little bit deeper into reactivity um, and explore from a Dharma point of view where that comes from and how to cut it. Uh, and then also from a science perspective or a secular perspective, how that relates to what's happening um, in the brain, so some light cognitive science. <laughs> uh, we're at the San Francisco Dharma Collective. Um, is anyone, is this your first time here? Welcome, welcome, welcome. 
Anyone online? First time? Great. Um, so the Dharma Collective is uh, a Sangha run, a community run organization. Um, so there isn't really hierarchy of teachers here. Um, we're all one community. Um, and one of the things that I really love about the, the name collective is that like we're this group of different Sanghas, different communities coming together to practice in different ways, but all kind of informed by the same truths that the Buddha laid out for us. Um, so we're forming our own little Sangha here, with mindfulness and the secular versus the sacred. So welcome to everyone. Tonight we're going to have um, some time to meditate. We'll be practicing. Um, I'll give a short teaching, and then we'll have some time to reflect and share. Okay. Um, so a few agreements before we start. So just presence. You know, it's super cliche to say that in a Dharma center. Let's be present. Um, but what does that mean? So just being present with what's coming up for you. Being present with the teachings, with the practice, what other people are saying. Um, avoiding, especially for those of us that are at home, on our computers, kind of avoiding that urge to check email or the news, uh, and really just being here, uh, giving yourself this gift of the next um, hour and 20 minutes to just be here. Um, we don't have to push away everything that's happening in the world, but we can kind of choose to come inwards. Um, I love this idea, and some of you have heard me say this before, it's like we're in a really busy restaurant, a really crowded restaurant, and there's conversations going on all around us, um, but we're having dinner with a friend, and so we can place our attention on the conversation that we're having with the person in front of us, even though this loud and noisy restaurant is happening around us. So whether that noise is 24th Street, or kids at home, or chatter in your mind, um, this idea of being present means that we just focus on the friend that we're having dinner with. We focus on the practice, we focus on the teachings, we focus on our experience. Um, respect, another agreement that you know we respect what other people are saying, their viewpoints. We all come from different backgrounds, uh, different genders, different races, different spiritual beliefs. And so let's all hold and create a container for that. Um, we all carry our own bias, some of them very, uh, many of them unconditional. Uh, and so let's assume, you know, positive intent when people are sharing um, and just giving the space for people to explore and express and respecting that. Taking care of yourself, so whatever that means for you in a practice, if you need to shift positions, if you want to come sit down on the floor or lay down, just taking care of yourself, listening to what you need. If at any time you need to take a break, there's tea and the bathroom in the back. Um, so really just take care of yourself. And um, finally, so um, these concepts may not be new for some of us. Um, so the invitation is to bring a beginner's mind, almost as if it's the first time that you're hearing uh, or practicing these, these concepts and these teachings. Is there anything that anyone else would like to add that would help them feel more comfortable or welcome in the space? Online, we're pretty informal, so if you want to put things in the chat or just unmute yourself and talk during uh, kind of open, open periods of sharing, please feel free to do that. So if there isn't anything else, um, let's move into a period of practice, okay? Um, so starting to make a transition inwards, finding a comfortable posture that we can rest for about 15 or 20 minutes, and perhaps you'd like to close the eyes or lower the gaze down, whatever feels comfortable for you in this moment. Just becoming aware of the body sitting on the chair or the cushion. And here we already have our first example of this busy restaurant. The noise, rise and fall. And we're here just settling in, noticing what's happening. Perhaps bringing a, a sense of lifting into the posture, extending from the tailbone all the way up to the crown of the head, just to help cultivate a sense of alertness for the practice.
inviting a sense of ease and relaxation into the body by checking the muscles of the face are relaxed. The jaw is soft. The shoulders dropping down. And just letting this wave of ease continue moving downwards through the body, letting the arms be heavy. Checking to see if there's any bracing or squeezing or tension in the abdomen or pelvic floor. And what it's like just to notice that. Maybe it will release and soften, maybe it won't. Letting the legs relax all the way down to the feet and the toes. And so taking a few moments to notice what's here right now. How are things in the mind, your thoughts? Maybe there's energy in the mind from things that happened earlier today, maybe conversations or to-do lists. I'm just noticing what it's like in the mind stream right now, not trying to change or fix anything. Just being curious of what it's like in the mind. For some of us, the mind may be very busy right now. For others, it may be a little bit more settled. And again, there's no way that you should or should not be right now. I'm just noticing the way it is. What's happening in the body right now? What sensations are coming forward? Maybe noticing the contact the body's making with the chair, or the floor, or cushion. Perhaps noticing a certain energy in the somatic field, maybe sleepy or tired. For some of us, maybe feeling energized and alert. Just checking in with the body, how it feels right now. And welcoming whatever we're finding here, whether it's pleasant or unpleasant. Finally, let's check in with the emotional landscape, the heart center. What mood, what emotions, what feeling tones are here? Some of us may be sitting with sadness or grief, fear or anxiety. Some of us may feel more content, joyful or grateful. Again, no right or wrong, just noticing what emotions are here. And what is it like to practice now with all three of these elements of what's happening in the mind, what's happening in the body, what emotions are we experiencing? I like to think of this as kind of zooming out and just being present with these three aspects, mind, body, and heart. And then just resting here. Nothing to do, nothing to change, nothing to make better. Just allowing this present moment exactly as it is.
notice how aspects of mind, body, and heart might shift and change as we rest here and notice. Perhaps noticing when the mind moves away from the present moment, is lost in thoughts or following sounds, and remembering that's never wrong in this practice. It's an opportunity to just be with and notice what's happening in our experience and then practice returning back to this open awareness of what's happening in body, mind, and heart. Stay here for a few more moments, just settling in, noticing what's here, noticing how the mind may be responding. And you can rest in this choiceless awareness of mind, body, and heart, or some of us might feel more supported by choosing an aspect that we can focus on more specifically like the breath or perhaps sounds or feelings of the body. And then again, just leaning back in the mind, resting here and being the observer. notice that the mind has slipped away from this present moment, you're already back in it just by noticing that the mind wandered away. And from here we can choose. We have agency. So making that choice when we're ready to let go of whatever it is that carried the mind away, to relax the body once again, and then return either to this spacious open awareness or the anchor that we've chosen to rest our attention with. Noticing if there's a story or a belief that this present moment should be a certain way, how the mind should be or the body should be. And just noticing that arise. And there is no way that things should or should not be. Just accepting mind, body, heart exactly as they are right now.
noticing how the mind may be responding to whatever it is that you're observing. If it's something unpleasant or uncomfortable, just notice how the stories unfold, how a thought may lead to a feeling, may lead to emotion, and then another thought. And if you're experiencing pleasantness in your practice right now, noticing how the mind responds to that. Savoring that moment. Being grateful for that experience. Perhaps even clinging and grasping to that pleasant feeling, wanting it to last longer or happen again. So not just noticing the feeling tones of this moment, but also how we react to them. So when a pleasant thought or sensation arises, how does the mind respond? And if it's something uncomfortable, pain in the body, a difficult thought, again, notice how we respond. So let's take that a little deeper. If you'd like to join me in turning your attention to something that's happening in your experience right now that feels pleasant, that feels good, feels supportive. Maybe it's the way the body is sitting. Maybe it's a soft touch of clothing. Maybe it's something that's happening in life right now that feels really good and that you're really appreciating. And so as we stay with this experience, whether it's a sensory experience in this moment or it's a thought form, a moment of gratitude for something that's happening in life, just notice how that might feel in the body sensations that may arise. Thoughts that may continue to build on top of each other as we think about and feel into this pleasant moment. noticing a shape or a color or a texture to this feeling. Just staying here for another moment, being with this pleasant aspect and watching what arises. And there's no right or wrong way of doing this, just noticing how you're responding to these invitations. Now let's make a slight transition, shifting from that pleasant aspect to something that's difficult right now. Maybe it's an unpleasant sensation in the body. Maybe it's a difficult thought or an unpleasant experience that's happening in life right now. as we rest our attention here on this unpleasant aspect, again, notice what arises in the body. 
what arises in the mind, what emotions are accompanied with resting here with this difficulty. overwhelming or you need to steady the mind, you can release that object of your awareness and come back to the breath or the feeling of the support beneath the body. And if and when you're ready, you can return back to this reflection on something that's unpleasant. Just noticing for a few more moments how this is unfolding for you, the thoughts, the feelings, the reactions. Now one final transition to zoom the awareness out and be with both this pleasant and unpleasant aspect that are happening simultaneously. So again, I like to think of this as kind of zooming out in the awareness, zooming out the lens of our attention to be with both of these aspects. And then again, notice what happens. Perhaps you're noticing the mind, the attention moving back and forth between the two. Maybe just resting with both at the same time. For some, the feelings may cancel each other out when we rest with both. Before we come to an end of this practice, releasing any thought form or object of mindfulness and just checking in, what's here now? How have things shifted in the past 20 minutes or so, mind, body, heart? Is it the same as when you first started practice or has anything shifted or changed? If you'd like to join me in taking one deep breath, following the air as it flows deeply into the body, and then slowly exhaling, releasing the air, letting go of this practice, and at the bottom of that out breath, beginning to make the transition out of practice, returning back to open eyes if they were closed making any movement or stretches that would help feel supportive to make this transition to the next moments of class. So thank you for that practice. Um, I'm curious, what did you notice in that? So there are, there are a lot of invitations happening there to just notice different aspects of your experience. So I'm just curious of what you were noticing. Um, are we doing the, mic the microphone? Right? If you're in the room, we'll pass the mic to you. And if you're online, you can uh, either raise your hand or just go ahead and unmute yourself. Thanks, Noah. So what did you all notice in that practice?
Uh, so what I noticed for me was um, specifically to the part where you mentioned, you know, sit with the good and then something was bothering you. It, you know, what came for me was me sitting in front of a mirror and the good was reflecting the bad and the bad was reflecting the good or something like that, you know, there was, and then I was like, oh, that's interesting that it's, it kind of equalizes and as soon as I had that thought, you said, sometimes it cancels each other out. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, there it is. Mm -hmm. So that's what came up for me. I, thank you for that. It was a great meditation. Yeah. What's your name? Ulysses, I'm sorry. Ulysses, nice to meet you. Um, may I ask a question? Yes. Um, we were talking about the mirror. Can you tell a little bit more about when you, you know, when you're thinking about something pleasant, the good and the bad that you were talking about with that reflection? I, you know, for so I, I, I do body work, and a lot of times when I'm working with people, I pull up a mirror, mm. and it's kind of to keep in center of focus. And any for me, it was like I, you know, the the intent of the meditation felt pleasant. Mm -hmm. And when you you know when you turn to focus to bring something uncomfortable, the other interesting thing was that I had an itch in my throat as soon as he said that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I wanted to cough out so bad, I'm like, I'm gonna try to hold it in. And so it's really, you know, sitting there, and that's where I had like a vision of the mirror, and I'm seeing myself wanting to cough, and at the same time, the meditation feels pleasant. Mm -hmm. So those two things are going on at the same time. Um, but I guess for me, the mirror is just a, I do it in my practice, it's, it's just a, a reflection to focus on myself. Mm -hmm. A lot of times people will, a lot of times some individuals focus outward. And so when I do my practice, I try to focus inward. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes I'll sit in front of the mirror at home too. And so whenever I'm meditating, I'm, I'm going in, mm -hmm. I guess. Mm -hmm. I'm curious about the, the itch in your throat. How come you didn't cough? Well, because again, as a body worker, when I'm working on someone, the last thing you want to do is cough. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I've um, spent years of training, but I, I can sometimes, uh, you know, maybe go away. Mm -hmm. It brings tears to my eyes, I like that. <laughs> it's a real interesting reflex. But yeah, no, I didn't want to cough because I didn't want to interrupt the, the session. And, and again, it's another, you know, like we were talking about um, noises or uncomfortable things without you know, at that moment that presented as an uncomfortable thing and I just asked myself, well, what do I do with this? Mm -hmm. Do I just mm -hmm. cough and ruin everyone else's meditation? Or can I just sit with it and see if I can, you know, go through it? Fortunately, I went through it. <laughs> <laughs> Great. And I think really just pointing to the, what I love about the mirror is that we're really just watching ourselves, we're observing how the mind is responding to all these different stimuli. Um, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that, but thank you for sharing that. Um, We'd love to hear if that sounded familiar for other people or had different experiences in that practice. I think someone put something in the chat. Yeah, know. okay, that's <laughs> fine. Uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, my name is Brendan, Hi, and Brendan. I'm really enjoying this tonight. Um, I mean, before the, um, the meditation part, it's like when you talked about your teacher in the Himalayas just like pranaming. I, I was just like, like so touched by that. I mean, it just like created this like space in myself where it was just like, anyway, it was just very very touching so thank you it just kind of put me in really a like a deeper place um, but I I really enjoyed the um, diving in and um, you know a couple little mainly thoughts came up um, I mean just to be specific I guess uh, that this summer I was living with my brother a little bit and you know I had some there was just some 
little things here and there, but it's like any time that comes up, I, I just find like lately in my delusion, I will want to like point a finger or something. And then I, I just send my brother love. <laughs> you know, I just like, like, what do I know? And it's like, it just immediately like makes the whole thing vanish because I'm just not interested in it's just a, it's a, a thought it's a like it's a like a delusional thing so anyway i just kind of let go of that and then um it was it was just nice i got into like a nice expansive place and i just felt like i got in my heart and it just felt really good and it's just um nice to uh, my friend robert here and kind of invited me to come and um, it's just, it's a beautiful place coming here. So thank, and thanks for being here. Yeah, can I ask a question? Um, actually, it's it's more about the first thing that you were sharing about kind of in response to how I opened the space and that you said your your reaction to that is deeper. If you felt like you were able to engage deeper. And was there a feeling in the body with that when you heard me say that? Yeah, I I, I was very, it was almost, I had an emotional response in a way. That was like a very, like, I almost felt, it, I could have like started crying in a way, you know, but it just kind of resonated deeply and I just, it was like, wow, that's, that's really beautiful, you know, to have like a teacher that, I mean, one of the things I've always done is coach tennis and <laughs> like I just thought about like sometimes it's just, like I'm around like these really loud kids sometimes. And I, I just had an imaginary thought where it's like I would pranam like in front of the kids. I never did that before, <laughs> but I had this visual and I, I think they'd be kind of like shocked by it a little bit, <laughs> you know, but it, it was a very, um, it just really touched me and, and um, yeah. You'll have to try that and let us know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, okay, good. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, really Thank interesting, you. you know, like how you were describing kind of like you heard me say something and then it kind of like had this visceral, like a feeling in the body uh, allowed you to go deeper into that moment. So I think, you know, what we're, what we're doing here is just noticing how we're responding to pleasant and unpleasant things, whether that's a, a thought or a feeling in the body. So even though that wasn't in the actual meditation, that's another example of how we're responding to, to different stimuli. So thanks for sharing that. Anything else that anyone wants to share about what you notice in that practice? Uh, I can, yeah, go ahead, Paige. Oh, thank you, Paige. Um, yeah, I just wanted to say thank you. I really needed that tonight. It was really busy in here, and there were so many changes throughout that short 30 minutes. Um, it was sort of mind blowing afterwards. I was like, wow, here I am again in this new place and in another new place. And there's a lot of that, um, was this unpleasant? And then I, you know, could focus on like my cat being here and, you know, a warm blanket and, you know, all of the other extra sounds um, did sort of cancel each other out. And it was just a really good moment to, um, just relax and like check inside. I feel like I hadn't really done that today. Mm. So it felt really good. And thank good. you. Thanks for sharing that, Kate. Um, and also, you? oh, sorry. Good. Oh, there's some things in the chat if you don't mind me reading them. Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, go for it. If anyone wants um, to that. Yeah, no, I think Eve chimed in uh, here in the chat that she appreciated a gentle welcoming with everything we were meeting through the practice, felt that gentleness really infuse my busy mind. And uh, Ben said, I think, oh, never mind. I, I think that was watching the chat, something else in the chat. But I just wanted to add Eve's note there. And Yeah, and so even what you were sharing is kind of like that tone that was set, it kind of, we responded to it as we went into the class, you know, so just noticing when someone says something pleasant, how, how that sets a tone for a conversation or a gathering like this, and equally when something unpleasant, like I'm very sensitive to sound, 
and especially the sounds on the street, like the, the motors revving. Um, you know, I have things in my database that that really triggers. Um, but then, like, noticing then, like, oh, okay, you know, that's the busy restaurant over there. You know, I'm here right now with this other other thing that I'm, I'm focusing on. So um, thank you all who shared, just kind of, like, articulating how you were responding to a certain type of stimulus, uh, which we'll, we'll talk about a little bit deeper now. Um, so in this um, series, we kind of look at, we look through different lenses um, at these concepts. So um, we look through the lens of Dharma, we also look through the lens of science and secular programming, um, secular methodology. Um, and so tonight we're going to kind of look a little bit deeper at our re reactivity. And we're going to start with the, the Dharma, the more overt way of looking at this and some of the Buddhist teachings. For those of you that are familiar with Vipassana, and have done a traditional Vipassana retreat, you may be familiar with the word samskara. Is that, uh, is that a new word for anyone? No, some of us, yeah. Um, so samskara is basically like an imprint. It's a Sanskrit word that describes kind of a karmic imprint that's on our consciousness. Uh, I like to think of this as almost like a non-physical stamp. Um, but a samskara would be something like, um, a uh, an emotional response that we're having to something in a practice like loud noise it's irritating me it's angering me it's triggering some some past things and so what happens is all of the imprints that I've ever had in this lifetime and many before that have felt similar to that lift their head so every other time that I've been triggered and irritated by loud noise or you know for me it goes to like a toxic masculinity place <laughs> Um, that, that samskara of toxic masculinity lifts its head and every memory that I have had, every imprint that I've had that is very similar to that, like, oh, you know, like the anger or the irritation stimulates something that's been stored away that feels familiar to it. And so a lot of times we'll notice, particularly in our meditation practice, um, but also outside, off the cushion as well, is that when you know we start feeling discomfort in our body, like our hip starts hurting, then we'll notice the thoughts start coming of, oh, my body's giving out on me. I wonder if this is an illness. Do I need to go to the doctor? My body's always betraying me. You know, like all these different thoughts. What if I can't do this? And so these are all the samskaras that are lifting their head up just from that, you know, maybe we just needed to change position. Uh, or maybe there is something more serious that needs to be looked at, but in our mind, we're starting to spiral. We're being, you know, all of these, I have this image in my head of these kind of like some scars as like <laughs> worms. Mm -hmm. And like when they get triggered, they all lift their head up and start looking around, you know? And it's like, how is this gonna knock us off? Is, are we gonna go into these thoughts? Are we gonna let these some scars rule our, our next movement, our next action? And so the, um, in Vipassana, we sit and many times in very uncomfortable, <laughs> positions without cushions um, with the idea of noticing what happens in our practice when we notice pain or when someone is um, making a lot of noise and starting to irritate us. These are all the triggers. These are all the samskaras being activated. And so what we do in a Vipassana is that we sit and watch it arise. And so by not reacting, by being equanimous and staying steady, even though this painful or this unpleasant experience is happening, it's said that we cut the necks, we cut the samskaras at their necks when we don't respond to them. And it also works on the other side of um, pleasant feeling. So a lot of times, you know, oh, this my, my mind is really calm, uh, the temperature is perfect, the room is quiet. And then this pleasant feeling, all the samskaras start of, of attachment, of pleasant experiences start lifting their head. Oh, this reminds me of that other time. Um, and I want it to last more. I want, I want it to be longer. I want to recreate this next time. And so those are samskaras of attachment. And so again, just when we're practicing and we're noticing that pleasant, that pleasant moment and then the thoughts and the feelings that come with it, we just notice that and we can cut some of our attachments at the neck. We talked two months ago about attachment, so if you wanna like, practice a little bit more with that, that recording is on YouTube. Um, but I'm not saying that, I just briefly wanna say with the pleasant feelings that we're not trying to push pleasant away, 
or just noticing this line between savoring and being grateful for that pleasant moment versus clinging and attaching and grabbing onto it because then it pulls us out of that moment. So these samskaras work for both aversions and attachments, the difficulty and the pleasant aspects. And when we're staying steady in our practice, um, you know, for those of you that have taken a traditional Goenka uh, uh, Vipassana, you hear him say when he's guiding meditations, there's not a trace of aversion. There's, not, there's no aspect of attachment to this moment. We're just watching it come and go and that we're staying steady. And this is the way that we cut those samskaras. This is the way that we kind of reprogram them um, so they don't lead to more destructive result or to further unpleasantness. So that's samskara, and that's kind of the, um, the, the theory that we're practicing, is that not reacting to pleasant or unpleasant, um, just staying steady can help kind of um, mitigate those samskaras. I taught this class this morning, and actually one of the students was brilliant, and she said, my way of cutting the samskaras is self-compassion. So the traditional way in Vipassana is just not reacting to what's happening. Just notice it arise, whether it's a thought or a feeling in the body. And then, because everything is impermanent, it will shift and change. So you're just noticing it rather than reacting to it. And what this student was saying is that not only just noticing it, but compassion becomes a way of cutting the samskara. So if we have these habitual patterns or responses of, of uh, aversion or avoidance, that actually being compassionate for that, oh, it makes sense that I'm like this, may I accept that I'm like that? You know, there's another, as many of you are familiar, that have sat with me on self-compassion practices. So I thought that was a really brilliant insight of not just equanimity, but also compassion um, for ourselves. Maybe even, I think the, the student this morning named um, that it was someone that was irritating her. And so her samskaras of irritation lifted and then she just applied compassion to it, and it cut them. So I thought that, that was really insightful. I just wanted to share that. So on the secular side, kind of what we know, that's like an ancient thousands and thousands of year old teaching about the Vipassana and samskaras. So on the secular, more science-based side, what's really happening there? And so um, I am not a brain scientist, <laughs> um, but I do know enough about cognitive science to explain that we, you know, we know that when something happens, we have a thought or we experience something, a neuron fires in the brain. And the more that we repeat that thought or that behavior or that reaction, that neuron, that neural connection becomes stronger and stronger. So the more that we practice it, the better we get at it. And if our practice is aversion or avoidance or these, these kind of destructive responses, we're going to get really good at reacting that way because there's this cliche that says neurons that wire together, fire together. So when one thing, one thought, or one experience happens, it starts lighting up the part of the brain that that's familiar to, or how those neural connections formed in the first place. Uh, and so we're practicing, we're strengthening those neurons. So we have to be careful of what we're practicing. You know, if, if we're in our practice and something irritating comes up that someone said to us, and then we just sit and stew with that, and then we start spiraling and spiraling, we're strengthening those neural connections in the brain. And so how do we change that? We know what the traditional Dharma teachings say of how to change that. We'd be equanimous, non-reactive, and compassionate. And so when we think about the brain, we know about neuroplasticity. The brain is plastic, it can change. And this also goes back to, from a Dharma perspective, change is possible, the third noble truth. So that we can actually create new pathways the way neuroplasticity works is that as we strengthen one area of the brain, another one will thin out. So if we start strengthening those neural connections of compassion, of kindness, of gratitude, of equanimity, of acceptance, non-judgment, these are all things that we practice when we're meditating. Uh, how the mind wanders away and we notice that and we come back. If we're kind of, as one of my teachers says, like whipping ourselves because the mind wandered, we're strengthening those neural connections of, of being critical on ourselves. And so when we practice non-judgment, noticing the mind wandering, ah, oh, that happened, it's part of the practice, I come back. We're creating a new neural connection. So we're cutting that samskara. We're creating um, new change in the brain. <clears throat> um, 
it's funny because I, I like to share personal examples and like this one is like, well, let, let me pick one of the hundred that happened already today. <laughs> um, and so I, I've noticed this pattern when I run, I run um, and when um, people cut me off or they step into my path or I know a car is not stopping, I get really irritated. And when I'm walking, that doesn't happen. If someone cuts me off or someone blows a stop sign, it's just kind of, it doesn't really phase me. But there's something about like this feeling of like maybe it's like entitlement that I have that I should be able to run in a straight line without people getting in my way. Um, <laughs> that So this morning that happened like three in a row, people just kind of stepping out, not watching where they're going. And then my thoughts like, why is everyone getting in my way? How come people can't see me? All of my old wounding, uh, like from my childhood comes up, just because someone wasn't really paying attention and they were just standing, you know, maybe they were just standing waiting for the bus there. Actually, I was in their way. <laughs> but the way that my mind was responding to that, all of these old samskaras, all these old neural pathways that I have of feeling um, not being seen or not being heard or not being respected, all of those samskaras lift their head and I'm just running through the Castro, you know? <laughs> like, and then I start, I notice that then the lens that I'm viewing through starts getting cloudy. And then I start thinking about like all those other samskaras of negative, destructive thoughts start arising. Meanwhile, again, it was just that one person stepping out. Now we're in the realms of my responsibility. I have to be with this. I have to notice what's happening and how I'm starting to then project my samskaras, project my abandonment wounds, project all the stuff onto other people. And so my practice is, hey, you know, when I run now, that's my meditation. That's how I work with irritation, is I take a deep breath, I wish them well, and I just keep running. So it doesn't just, you know, magic wand doesn't happen, but it's my practice. So over time, I'm cutting those samskaras. Every time it happens, keep my mouth shut, it's not a big deal. It's not worth getting into an argument with someone. That's reprogramming, that's rewiring the neural connections in my brain and cutting those samskaras at the neck. So then the next time it happens, there's more availability for me to choose a different response. And that's really what meditation is, that's what mindfulness is, is creating space, creating agency for us to choose rather than being carried away by our autopilot, our habitual reactivity. It's learning how to pause, take a deep breath, offer ourselves some love, offer someone else some love. These are all ways that we can both cut the samskara and reprogram what's happening um, with the neural connections. So what, what, what resonates for you with that? What questions might you have? Or what are you, what are you thinking about when you hear these concepts, both from the Dharma perspective and from kind of modern science? I love the connection between the Dharma and the neuroscience, and it really resonates with me. I probably had like a hundred things also happen each day that are like these, just these recurring patterns and, and paths in my brain, and um, I do a lot of meditating, <laughs> and it still doesn't completely dissipate and go away. And so, um, as you were describing that, I was like, yeah, I you know like I have these I have these patterns that um, I've done so much work to try and break and stories in my head that I try and stop and um, so it's really validating actually just to kind of hear the neuroscience behind that it gives me something else to think about and and uh, the, I love the neuroplasticity as well but ability for us to be able to strengthen another part of our brain. Yeah. It's a, you know amazing when I hear, you know, when I hear traditional teachings on the noble truth, you know, and that, that third noble truth that change is possible. It's like, how did the Buddha know about neuroplasticity? You know? <laughs> but I think, you know, what Marisa is sharing from personal experience, you know, don't need a brain scan to know that that works, you know, that like we have it takes work to reprogram and it begins with noticing. It's that awareness that this is the way it is. This is what's happening. And I love that you know, you're know you pointing to this, is that we can practice this in our meditation. We don't have to practice it when people are, you know, um, well, it's, it can be more supportive to practice it in meditation. 
than actually doing it in real life. It gives us some new neural connections. The more that we practice this kind of steady mind, no matter what's arising, welcoming the pleasant and the unpleasant equally, um, then we will, over time, be able to see that, that effect off the cushion. So thank you for pointing to that. And I think it's also real, you know, what you're saying. It takes time. There's no magic wands, you know, it's practice, it's discipline, it's awareness, it's compassion. Thank you. I do have a follow-up question. Mm -hmm. I think it's a human thing to react to things, right? So the problem is not reacting, but rather reacting and staying with that feeling. Because the moment someone cut you off, a lot of things a lot of things are triggered, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe from childhood, or maybe your personal safety had been at risk mm -hmm. because they cut you off and they could have caused an accident. Mm -hmm. So it is okay to react to the moment, but what is not okay then is to stay with that feeling because probably triggered a negative feeling, right? Mm -hmm. And you take it personal. Mm -hmm. but if you stay with that feeling, I see that be very damaging, but mm -hmm. what if you react to it as human and then you move on? Mm -hmm. is, is that that's what makes sense. And yeah, absolutely. And well, I asked, for, you know, what are your what are your thoughts on that? Well, I'm human, <coughs> yeah, so I would react. To yeah. It. And I think saying I'm human that's self compassion. Like this is part of. There was a moment today where I was irritated about something, and I was just walking, and I'm like, oh, right, this is part of being human, right? Mm -hmm. So I think that that's that act of compassion, which is saying it makes sense, and I'm having this reaction. It's great first right. step. In in um, MBSR, we get in the mindfulness-based stress reduction program. We get really specific that um, that there's a difference between reaction and response, and so that yeah, it's hard to change our reactivity, especially when it comes from our personal database, our history, our conditioning, things that have happened, our traumas, um, and so it does make sense that we would have certain reactions, but it doesn't mean that we have to then act on it. You know, so for me, my reaction might have been like the irritation in my mind, but I just kept running. That was my skillful response. Uh, so yes, it is, it is important to acknowledge our humanity and that this is a normal part of the way that our mind operates and what you're pointing to in many ways it could be a, a safety and survival mechanism. Um, so it's that discernment that comes through awareness of what's happening in that moment. Um, but yeah, you know, the model, I could, I could, I could go deep into this, but we don't have to. <laughs> the model is that we move from autopilot reactivity to observer, and then from observer to skillful responder. Mm -hmm. And we do this all through mindfulness and heart opening, so wisdom and compassion. So I was just weaving together a lot of the secular and the sacred words there. So does that, how's that sound? Yeah. 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 Thanks for sharing that. Um, was there anything in the chat? Are we good? I'm having a hard time seeing the screen. Okay. Go ahead, whoever that is on, online with your hand up. Hi, this is Katya. Yeah. Um, what was I going to say? <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> what was helpful for me? I mean, I I will obsess on something while I'm meditating, like round and round. Not not tonight so much, but it's it's very frustrating. But the thing that helps me um, give self compassion is to remember that it does come from that some scar, that it does come from some perhaps early trauma or perhaps you know terrible repetitive events and. It's not just my mind trying to drive me crazy. <laughs> you know, there really is a reason that I'm getting stuck in that mud that has to do with the past. And it, it does need compassion, I think, to come, come free. Mm. Beautiful. <clears throat> Thank you for sharing that. Thank you. And I, I love what we're, you know, in these examples that we're hearing, it's a little bit different for all of us. In the meditation practice, the traditional instructions are kind of, you know, watch the attachments and aversions arise in your practice. 
and how it puts that lens or that filter on everything that starts unfolding from there. But how we do that off the cushion, there's a lot of different ways. It could be repeating a mantra, like, oh, this makes sense. Um, it could be pausing. Instead of that initial habitual reaction, just take a pause, take a deep breath. Um, so it can be different for a lot of us. Some of us are going to compassion for other people, compassion for ourselves. So there's kind of this very broad toolkit of practices that we can apply to this. The traditional Vipassana way is more about the equanimity in the actual practice. And then eventually, you know, my, my personal belief on like a, a Vipassana retreat, it takes a, really, it takes a long time to get to the metta, to the loving kindness part of it. Um, but uh, I think that the instructions are really helpful for the mindfulness aspect of it that we can just generate a little bit more of a heart response to in, in combination with it. So anyway, just noticing that it's a little bit different for all of us. So we're going to do a little reflection right now and kind of go a little bit deeper into this um, to explore that. Okay. So uh, I'm going to guide this as a reflection. If you want to do this as a meditation with your eyes closed, if you want to journal, if you, we have some paper and pen here or at home if you want to journal. Um, it's really up to you. Um, it's perfectly fine to just do this as a meditation and follow along with my prompts. Um, but you can also do it as a journal. Okay. Does anybody here want some pen and paper? While we're kind of getting settled for this, uh, the other thing I wanted to point to, I was talking a lot about the third noble truth. So for those of you that might be f uh, newer to the Dharma, um, this is kind of the fundamental teaching that the Buddha left us. The first noble truth, that there is suffering. The second is the cause of that suffering, this mistaken view that we have of the way that reality works and our attachments and our aversions that come with that. And then the third noble truth is that change is possible. And the fourth being the path towards that change. So even the Buddha laid out some options. You know, we got eight, the, the Eightfold Path of mindfulness and speech and action and all of the different um, steps along that noble path are ways of cutting those samskaras. So um, we can talk more about that if there's interest. We'll, you know, I think over time we'll do a, a whole series of kind of secular versus sacred with the noble truths. Maybe we'll do that next year. Um, so. If you're interested in learning more, you know, looking up that fourth noble truth, and it really lays out that kind of roadmap to alleviating some of these samskaras. Okay, so let's transition back inwards. Maybe you'd like to close the eyes, soften the gaze. And just take a moment to come to the breath or a sensation in the body just to anchor yourself again in this moment. So I'll be asking a series of questions for you to reflect on and just see what comes up. Be curious, be open-minded. So the first question is starting to identify some, some scar that you might have, some habitual pattern of reactivity, something that triggers you often. Maybe it's a person or a situation but just starting to focus in on one habitual pattern or one samskara that you'd like to work with. And maybe you'd like to use your visualization or imagination to see this happening in the mind's eye, if it's an event or a conversation It's visualization or just using your cognition to know that this is present for you, this is part of your life, part of your way of being right now. And what is it like when you get triggered? So when this irritating or annoying thing happens, what is it like in the body? What response arises in the somatic field? Maybe it's a tightening of the chest or energy in the arms. And when we get 
triggered in this way, there's the physiological response in the body, and then also the psychological response in the mind. So how does this affect our state of mind, our mood? How may it affect the lens that we're experiencing the world through when we're triggered? thoughts spiraling, beliefs about ourselves becoming reinforced, stories and narratives unfolding. And as we all know, these triggers can oftentimes lead to destructive results. And so for a moment, considering what would a constructive result to this trigger be? What is it that would be helpful in the moment of a trigger to tell yourself how to act, take a deep breath, pause, just taking some time here to think about a new way of responding to this trigger. So this might be a phrase or a mantra. might be an action like pausing, taking a deep breath, maybe taking a break and calming down and then heading back into the situation with a clearer view. And now with yourself in that situation of trigger, imagine this new way of responding happening. So instead of your habitual reaction to that samskara or that neural connection firing, what's one thing different that you can do that would lead to a constructive result? Sometimes this might even include not taking action, walking away, holding your tongue. And other times it might include compassionate and mindful communication, expressing how we're feeling to another. But now just imagining that you're taking that constructive action to this trigger. And what does that sound like, look like, feel like for you? Imagining that you're responding skillfully rather than reacting habitually. And even in this visualization, we're helping to create and strengthen those new neural connections of how we'd like to respond. So visualizing it, becoming familiar with the feeling, we're practicing our skillful response. we end this reflection, perhaps there's an intention that you'd like to set here, a way of responding to some scars when they lift their heads, a way of reprogramming our neural pathways to respond in a more compassionate way. Make a transition out of this reflection, returning back to open eyes if you had them closed. I want to read this poem. I think I might have read it at our last class, but it's a good one, so I'm going to read it again. Um, so this poem is called Autobiography in Five Short Chapters. Chapter one, I walk down the street. There's a deep hole in the sidewalk. I fall in. I am lost. I am helpless. It isn't my fault, and it takes forever to find a way out. Chapter 2. I walk down the same street again. There's a deep hole in the sidewalk. I still don't see it. I fall in again. 
I can't believe I'm in the same place. It isn't my fault. It still takes a long time to get out. Chapter three, I walk down the same street. There's a deep hole in the sidewalk. I see it there. I still fall in. It's habit. It's my fault. I know where I am. I get out immediately. Chapter four, I walk down the same street again. There's a deep hole in the sidewalk. I walk around it. Chapter five, I walk down a different street. So I just want to open it up to kind of talk about what that reflection might have been like, if anyone wants to share um, what your intention is. It can be a power behind putting some vibration to your intention, um, or any reactions to that, uh, that poem. So what comes up for y'all? thinking a lot about um, self-compassion as a constructive response and even just the poem that you read with, where I think it was the third verse where he fell in and, and before he was saying it's not my fault or it's, it is my fault and I think part of that is like accountability and taking you know ownership of, of things that we do um, and then there's also the line that we can cross where it becomes too much like self-blaming mm -hmm. Um, and that's kind of like one of the trenches that I have, and so I'm trying to like practice more self-compassion to to rewire, mm -hmm. you know, those neurons and those responses. Um, and I guess I'm trying to learn like what are some of those like those methods? Is it just kind of accepting like okay, well, right now it's like this. Right now, I feel like garbage, and I just have to like sit with that and not. You know, be frustrated and like, okay, let me go do something else, or why do I feel like this again? Or um, so, I would love any thoughts or um, feedback from you or anyone else who has ideas and things that have worked for them. What have you noticed so far in your journey with self compassion? Um, I think for me, it feels like it's a stepping stone to also like to forgiveness. Mm -hmm self-forgiveness um, I feel like I can't really get to forgiveness without first getting to the compassion um, and I notice that it's harder for me to do with myself than it is with other people um, you know they always you know people will say like well how would you talk to a friend about this or someone you love right um, and and you would probably be a lot more compassionate about it um, but I also have an easier time forgiving other people and, and letting things go and so I, I sort of just recently was like why am I having a hard time with like even self-forgiveness and then I was like oh I need to take a step back and <laughs> maybe figure out this like so whole self-compassion thing um, and I think part of it is just like I have like unrealistic expectations for myself but in, in different areas that you know it's it's kind of like well who's going <laughs> to live up to those standards and of course you're going to frustrated um, and I think part of like you know my entry um, point is that, that some things that are helping are, are just like okay I'm not like one of the things I try to do is just avoid it like I, I'm scared of it and so then it's like with those feelings and so it's like okay I need to go and do something productive mm -hmm. um, or go for a run or whatever it is and, and just get outside and um, not dwell on it um, and so now it's more just like, all right, well, maybe I need to sit with that discomfort for a little bit and just accept, you know, um, you know right now it's like this. And, um, and so, yeah, that's sort of like where I started, my starting point. Yeah. I appreciate how you were describing that as stepping stones, you know, and it's kind of like, the compassion, the self-compassion, the forgiveness aspect, and also just to point to everything that you've been sharing is a really sharp awareness of what's going on in your experience. So I'd actually say the starting point is mindfulness. This is what it's like right now. 
that's, you know, even that is, you know, they say knowing is half the battle. I think the other half is, is compassion, right? <laughs> Um, so yeah, noticing, noticing what's coming up and how you're responding to it. That's the first. And then as you were talking about, you were kind of listing all of your tools there, going out for a run or, you know, applying self-compassion. Um, so you have, you have that in your toolbox. And the last thing I would say is that it's just time and practice. You know, yes, there are times where, uh, what I love about the samskara and the vipassana example is that you're practicing that while you're meditating. So it's kind of like a real, it's an example, you're actually experiencing aversion that you can just watch and feel and then and accept, that was the other word I hear you say a lot. Um, but then practices like mindfulness in general or self-compassion, these are things that we just have to keep practicing. And a lot of times we will see the result. It's not like uh, when, when someone cuts us off, it's like, hold on a second, I need to meditate. Right? It's like that we're, we're building those, we're building those connections, which you're doing. So it's just that diligence and that discipline to stay with the practice. Uh, and over time, it, it does, you know, this is what we know from the, the science is that it, the neuroplasticity does take time. You know, a lot of the research for mindfulness is based on um, practicing 45 minutes a day for months. You know, that's where we really start seeing the changes in the prefrontal cortex. So anyway, my, my invitation would be keep practicing, keep doing what you're doing because you're starting to like these, these um, insights that you're having are really powerful about the way things are and how you're responding to them. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Cage or Diane, would you be able to read that? Yeah, Ben just wrote, hold on a sec, I need to meditate. That's basically <laughs> what nonviolent communication is, LOL. Oh, um, yes, you're I'm, always training something, building something, some kind of relationship with your device, paraphrasing Randy Fernando and Spirit Rock day long about technology addiction and a few years ago. And then he said, hold on a sec, I need to meditate. That's basically <laughs> what nonviolent communication is, LOL. Mm. I, I really appreciate you naming nonviolent communication because that's for me, I've, I've been practicing it and it, for me it's been really hard, you know, of like there is, a, I want to play the blame game and I want to put my, my emotions and my feelings, make, you know, give that power to other people and I'm realizing like the, that um, the nonviolent communication is a very skillful way of honoring the experience that I'm having and taking ownership for it, like in the poem that chapter where this person decided to change the story. I take responsibility. I knew this was coming. And so that's kind of what I love with the nonviolent communication is like we have to take accountability for our emotions and then communicate them in a way that's, that's soft, that's skillful, it's non-blaming, non-accusatory. So I lo I'm, I'm, I sometimes I think in, in imagery and right now as we're all sharing, whether it was Ben or what was your name again? Melissa. Melissa. Um, as people are sharing, it's almost like there's this like collective toolbox that we're forming in front of us of all these different practices that we can pull from to to help us through these moments. Thank you, Ben. So uh, going back to that reflection, did anyone have an intention or anything specific that they wanted to work with? What was it like when you visualized that? Anything come up there? Um, for me, the reflection was um, to not take things personally, right? Um, and I tend to shut down, you know, um, someone is either, you know, gets angry towards me or, you know, you know gets confrontational. And where I feel is in my chest, my body times up. And it's a better step than I was before because before I would react violently. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so now it's just like instead I just like, you know, I, I kind of close down. Um, but it, a lot of times I realize that people, you know, when they're going through things or when people are, you know, like when you're on your run and someone cuts you off, they're not doing it intentionally, you know, and, and a lot of times, you know, we take it personally. And it's, for me, it's just now, it's, 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 it's a practice of trying not to take things personally because you don't know what the other person is experiencing or you don't know why they're 
right? reacting that way, right? And and to just tell them, um, you know, hey, this is this is making me feel, you know, X, Y, and Z, uh, instead of just like keeping quiet and you know saying, you know, I don't want to talk about this, or I don't want, you know, I don't, don't want to hear this, or I don't want to talk about that. But that was a really good reflection for me. Thank you. Yeah, and it can be helpful to visualize what that looks like, you know, especially if it's a difficult conversation, you know, to just visualize what even just like the opening lines of it are. Um, but that's why in that practice, the invitation is to visualize what is it like to cut that samskara at its neck, you know, like how does that sound, how does that feel, um, what actions am I taking to do that. So um, I, I highly recommend the visualization aspect of that or journaling of what would life be like if I didn't react that way, if I took a deep breath before I responded. And I heard you say that very clearly, like this nonviolent reaction you were able to overcome um, just by practicing that. So thank you for sharing that. Hi, I'm Cece. Um, I think I grew up in a family that's not very comfortable with negative emotions. And so my own like experience is to be very like avoidant. Uh, and so I have been working, like I'm not comfortable with other people's negative emotions. I either want them to be like placated or I want to ignore them. Um, and so it's something I, I envisioned a very like small example that is kind of like a chronic small household issue with my husband and like how I would express my like feelings about like that, that is not positive, but like clear and nice still. So I'm gonna practice it, we'll see. <laughs> Love that. Thanks for sharing that. Again, you know, what I'm hearing from everyone that's sharing is this like really sharp awareness of what it's like. And it might sound like um, we're not, for me, that's like the starting point, you know, like knowing how I'm feeling, how I'm reacting. It's surprising how many people would, are out there in the world and they're not paying attention. Even if, even if we don't have the, the path to the skillful response yet, just noticing, knowing that this is what my experience is, accepting it, you know, we can't really let go and move on until we accept that something is the way that it is, even if it's unpleasant. So, um, yeah, and I just heard it again when you were sharing, is like, this is the way that things are, this is how I am, um, that's kind of the starting point, and then applying these, um, that intention is, is really nice on top of that, yeah. We uh, wrote something in the chat. My realization uh -huh. is that I can choose to respond in different ways. In this case would be to say less, take pause, not engage in aggressive interactions. I'm realizing when I visualize, I can only change my way of my own way of being. I realize, I'm realizing when I visualize, I can only change my own way of being in a situation. I can't assume that will change the other person's desire to be escalated. And when possible, I can just take a break and go for a walk to breathe. Yes. Who, uh, who read that? Diane read it for Lish. Oh, thank you, Lish. Beautiful. <laughs> as, you, as, as Diane was reading Lish's comment, I saw, again, I was just seeing this like sword, you know, this is like cutting that, that uh, destructive reaction uh, as you were talking about the toolkit that you use. I kind of saw this like slicing through that, that response, that reaction. Thank you for sharing that. So we're almost at the end of our time. So uh, let's just take a few moments to dedicate the merit that we've been generating in this practice together. So maybe you'd like to close the eyes, coming inwards one more time. And we'll end this class the same way we began, noticing what's here right now was present for you in the mind, the body, the heart. And what it's been like to hear these teachings on reactivity, samskaras, neuroplasticity. For some that might feel overwhelming, like there's a lot of work ahead. For others, it may feel inspiring or a sense of optimism. Change is possible. And so as we reflect on the energy that we've been cultivating together here as a Sangha, practicing 
listening to teachings, both secular and sacred, and that reflection of how we'd like to intend to meet our habitual patterns. Let's dedicate all of that energy to the liberation of suffering, our own, those around us, We cultivate the mindful awareness, the wisdom and clear seeing of mindfulness, accepting the way things are, accepting ourselves the way we are. And may this open heart, this heart of compassion for ourselves and others lead us. May our skillful responses be of the greatest benefit for all beings, including ourselves. May we move forward from this time together tonight, continuing to practice transforming life into our meditation. May there be peace in the world. If it feels comfortable for you to lower your head and bow, a sign of reflection, of respect for each other, honoring the practice that we've done together tonight, and also bowing to your own enlightened mind, your own Buddha nature, your perfect completeness exactly as you are. So thank you all for your practice, for your participation. Thank you to Noam and Cage and Diane, our volunteers for tonight. Yeah.